Welcome back to RSA Conference 2022. We are still recording live here at the Marriott Marquis. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview is Merritt Maxim. He is Vice President and Research Director at Forrester. Welcome, Merritt. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here after two years. Yes, I know. I was just telling you, the, the one of the last interviews I did was with one of your colleagues, Janan Budge, uh, in 2020 before everything kind of shut down. Yep. So it's good to be back Absolutely. in person, seeing people again. It's A lot of us have not been back to San Francisco uh, since, uh, so it's good to be back. Let's talk about identity and access management and the latest trends. Uh, we actually um, have a physical event called Identiverse coming up in a yep. couple weeks in Denver. Uh, we bought that business from Ping Identity uh, late last year. There is a ton of interest in that event. The, the the attendance rates, the, the sponsor rates, just there is a lot of activity around identity and access. And there's been some interesting news in this space over the past few months. Just let's start at the high level. Like what are some of the high kind of what are the some of the top trends that are happening in identity and access? Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind and I know it's hard to keep referring back to COVID, but certainly the pandemic had a dramatic effect on identity and access management. In many cases, it forced companies to actually deploy an identity and access management solution, whether it was just simple MFA or an actual SSO solution. And companies who had always been kind of on the fence of that had to kind of uh, make the choice because everyone was remote. And um, they, they realized that was a, a big driver for them. And if you look at the financial results of the IDAS vendors in that space, they, they benefited significantly from from that run-up. Uh, so, so, and I think that's going to continue now because we're in that kind of hybrid work phase mm -hmm. and um, you know, users have gotten a custom of that and so we'll continue to see um, you know dominance in that whether it's for simple um, SSO kind of access manager stuff or more kind of full-blown identity and life cycle you know join or move or labor type processes where there's where there's uh, governance and other things in, in play to, to ensure that users actually have um, the appropriate level of access and entitlements for, for their job function. So as we were going through the pandemic and we were forced from on-prem into remote work and as people were deploying solutions were they just trying to grab best of breed and just deploy it, get it out and get it up f as fast as they could because they were in this transition period and it had to happen pretty quickly. And what's the impact of that now later when you look at how do you build out a holistic identity and access management platform? Did were, were decisions that were made then still relevant today as you think about this in the long term? Or is there some shifts in strategy that organizations need to think about going from where we were two years ago mm -hmm. over the next few years? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it's still, uh, I don't have enough kind of sense on how, how strong it is, but certainly pre, in the on-prem world, identity access management was still a very much transactional type of initiative where companies would say, okay, we need to do the SSO piece or we need to do the identity management piece. And while they may have, you know, worked into a platform over time, it was rare that they would say right off the bat, we're going to invest in a Oracle, IBM, CA, Novell platform, and they're going to be our de facto identity platform going forward. Um, they may have ended up at that point down the road, but they didn't necessarily start there. In the SaaS world, that's a little bit different now where they can invest right up front and say, I'm going to go with Azure Active Directory, I'm going to go with Octa, I'm going to go something like that. And even if they may only use a portion of those capabilities, certainly in the SaaS model allows them to turn off or, or turn down uh, turn on or turn off certain features over time. So, so I think that is a is a benefit. The other. Uh, big change on the on the SaaS side is switching costs are considerably less. So if you're not happy with your current SaaS provider for whatever reason, whether it's cost or service, um, you can actually switch, you know, fairly easily. And I talk with plenty of customers who do that. Uh, on the on-prem side, you know, switching from an on-prem offering to another, whether it's to a cloud offering, or is a much bigger uh, amount of effort. So in some ways, companies who made that investment during the pandemic have actually given themselves more flexibility um, down the road in terms of being able to to add features and again uh, potentially move off a platform if they don't feel it's meeting their their current needs or requirements a longer term yeah interesting because you think about these investments as being long-term investments but if the switching costs aren't that big and there are other solutions out there so what does that do to the market dynamics because you've got some large public players in mm -hmm. this space right some platform players and then some kind of point solutions you got the cyber arcs and the octas you know you got your pam and your sso and both of those companies have done added capabilities into their platforms. You've got SailPoint that just got acquired and, and Ping Identity also as a public company. Do we continue to see consolidation 
uh, an integration of these capabilities going forward? Or do you see a lot of uh, best in breed solutions snapping into larger platforms? Like, where does this go from here? Because I, my guess is, if you're just doing one thing in identity and access, you have a limited TAM and, and therefore some level of consolidation of other features, functionalities kind of makes sense, don't they? Yeah, I think convergence is certainly a possibility and potentially with where stock market valuations are going, it makes you may actually make it financially feasible. I mm -hmm. think in the last year, the valuation of has just made it not economically uh, possible. So I think that's certainly a play. But I do think that there is still a place for the pure plays. And, and I would argue companies like SailPoint, uh, Ping Identity, Forge Rock, which is another company that went public right. recently, I think they've done well by staying kind of true to their roots and not trying to do everything. And yes, at the end of the day, that does limit their TAM, but it also makes it very clear to buyers what they they do or don't do. In, in some cases, you know, strategy is, it, what's important in strategy is not just what you do, but also what you don't do. And being very explicit about that helps buyers to say, okay, this vendor doesn't do PAM, so it means we need to look somewhere else or vice versa. And I think for buyers, that still is helpful. It doesn't still mean that the platform plays don't still have a role because the reality is there's a huge amount of white space in that access management. You know, one of the things that continues to surprise me as a Forrester uh, analyst is the amount of companies that I talk to, again, mainstream, large Fortune 500 companies that have done very little, if anything at all, with an access management. It's mm -hmm. still a manual-based process. It may may have purchased a product, but the, so there is still a lot of upside that can benefit all vendors, and it's not necessarily a, a zero-sum game where in order to win business, you have to displace an incumbent because so many companies have done uh, you know very little with that access management to date. Yeah, interesting. When I think about Microsoft for a second, right, We were. I was talking to Paul Mackay from your team, from, from Forrester yesterday, and we were talking about consolidation plays, right? And we, we just scratched the surface with Microsoft a little bit, but Microsoft's been making some very interesting inroads into the security space, and they own the directory. Mm -hmm. The world does, a, in with the E5 contracts and the move to Azure, and you're going all in, how big of a role does Microsoft play in the identity and access management space going forward? I mean, are they are they the big player that everybody else has to work with in this space? They're 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 a huge player, and not just yeah. because of an access management, because of their entire security portfolio. I mean, you, an argument can be made that they are the most have the broadest security portfolio in the industry when you look at from Sentinel to Defender to, um, you know, they just announced an MDR service. Uh, it, it, it's a, it, in it, reality, it's a, it's been a remarkable transformation. I mean, if you go back to this conference 15 years ago, Microsoft was really the punching bag for, for security, right? Yep. And they, they really took it on the chin a few years. And, and uh, I'll give them credit that they, they have done a good job at uh, turning around on that and, and investing heavily. And uh, while their, you know, Azure Vector Directory product, you know, may not fit everyone's needs, it is still a compelling product, and of course, the ability to uh, integrate that with other parts of the micro platform is, is a very hard uh, thing for buyers to, to ignore. And so, I think they are going to continue to be be the be the major one of the major players in this space, and continue to drive a lot of what happens in the access management space going forward. Yeah, and it just creates a really interesting competitive landscape then, because micro, you've got to play nice with Microsoft in this space, right? Whether you're a multi-factor authentication, a single sign-on vendor, a privilege access management vendor, if the directory and, and what they've been doing continues in that momentum, you know, a lot of these players are going to have to to work very closely with Microsoft to build out these holistic identity and mm -hmm. access management uh, solutions, right? Yeah, correct. And I think the other thing we've already seen is that some of these features are increasingly becoming commoditized. So SSO, particularly from an user perspective, it's pretty straightforward. I, I click on an icon and I get a, I get single sign-on. So the user experience, whether it's Okta, whether it's one login, whether it's uh, CyberArk, whether it's Markup, is all going to look the same. And so over time, that's going to be table stakes. If it's factory, it probably already is table stakes. So really, where where the vendors have to differentiate themselves is on other things, whether it's around you know analytics and behavioral stuff to say, okay, right. we can detect unusual access patterns as it's happening and try to flag that, or different methods of of, um, of authentication, more kind of real time or continuous authentication. So so there will continue to be differentiation there, but some of these kind of core features that the everyday user relies on are increasingly, you know, becoming standardized and, and everyone offers them and, and everyone increasingly expects those to be, be part of whatever offering they're using. It, that's great um, to know that because I think it, it, it just goes back to the point, you, you know, of, of where the industry's evolved. Do you see the same thing with MFA? 
or do we still have a lot of friction and a lot of challenges around multi-factor authentication? Or have we gotten to a point where it, it's somewhat standardized, we're just going to use, you know, SMS text messages on our phone as the second authenticator and, and, and we move on? Or, or is there more challenges and things we need to do with multi-factor? I think for the enterprise, I think MFA has got has matured significantly. Again, the pandemic played a big role in that. Uh, I think uh, there continues to be concerns about man in the middle attacks on the text-based approach. So in in app push notifications is probably where, um, uh, but that may require additional. Now you're you, now you're asking the user to deploy something on their device, and are you BYOD? Are you going to have tension there about now the users want? And so there there's kind of that issue. But yeah, I, I think MFA is. Um, uh, it's kind of re reached a critical point where we still have a lot of work to do is on the consumer side where yeah. consumer adoption remains incredibly low. I think Twitter announced last year that I think less than 5% of the users um, use 2FA for Twitter even though they've had it in the platform for like a, um, you know over uh, 10 years. So that, and that's the issue, changing consumer behavior is very hard. Um, yeah. Even though users know passwords are bad, they're kind of creatures of habit and it's hard for them to break that. And that's, I think, the that's really the, the next... Um, uh, nut that needs to be cracked, and, and the vendors can help do that. But but you, you talk with the bank, that's a that's a real challenge for them. They know yeah. passwords are bad. They know they want to get away from them. But how do you, sh short of outright financial incentives, what do I do to actually get the move the dial so actually people will actually want to you know use it? Now the good news is people are using it more in their daily work life now, so they're more comfortable with it. So when the uh, the bank or their retailer offers it, they may be more inclined to use it. But again, they still have to kind of be prodded or nudged along to actually want to to um. You know, to change what they've been doing for you know uh, five plus years in terms of authenticating into a site. Yeah, users know passwords are bad. They don't enable MFA and they click the link. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. The perfect storm. Yes. For what's been happening with ransomware and all these other attacks. Right. Yeah. And so, how do you change the consumer mindset to limit those attacks? You talked briefly about uh, user behavior. Right. There was this, you know, there for a while you had user entity behavior yeah, analytics, UEBA. Yeah. UEBA that kind of became, it, it was kind of a standalone market. Now it's just kind of part of the SIM discussions. There's been other behavior analytics around biometrics and other capabilities. What's going on in the user behavior space and how is that being integrated in to the identity strategy? So it's certainly, I, I think, as we I talked a little bit about kind of continuous authentication, that's, I think, where it starts to get in play where I am maybe some form of continuous evaluation of your usage and using that to determine if there is something outside of uh, outside of pattern. And behavioral biometrics has been around for a while. Um, it has some promise. Uh, it obviously doesn't work particularly in the consumer space because it requires some level of consent, but but that's kind of think where, where some of that um, is approaching. The challenge, of course, is that in this hybrid work world is that users' behavior is more variable than it was when you were in the office nine to five every day. So these models really need to be more finely tuned so that if suddenly at the last minute you decide to work from home that day and, and or you work off hours because of childcare or other commitments that you're suddenly not generating all these alerts because your activity falls outside of some established norm. And, and so that's, I think, one of the bigger problems that I think the industry has yet to kind of um, uh, address in, in hybrid work is just going to, is going to force them to, to, you know, fine tune things to be able to do do a better job of that. Because the one thing I hate most is when I'm on the road and I have to reauthenticate all my office yes. logins, right? Yep. Because it realizes I'm coming from a different network. It realizes yep. I'm not where I was. And that is a friction point in yep. the equation that yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I, I, I see I, it all the time. I'll give you a great example of that where I, I got a new machine, uh, set up my, my personal email account and says, this is a new machine. We want to verify it, you're, it's you. So we're going to send an email to your backup account. Well, my backup account is also on a new machine. So the backup account says, okay, we want it. So you get in this literally like never ending cycle of um, yeah. uh, confirming and, and new de new devices are, is in one case where it generates a huge amounts of disruption and um, so you only get one maybe every couple of years. And so having to work through that, it was an interesting kind of, uh, uh, kind of virtuous cycle that I uh, had to try to get out of in order to kind of enable the, the email to actually work again. Yeah, it just it's an interesting dilemma, yeah, kind of in the catch-22. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, awesome. Ma uh, Mary, it was great having you on. Thank you for Okay, thanks us. for having me, man. Enjoyed yeah. it. Enjoy the show. Thank you for watching. We're, we've got another interview coming up, so stay tuned.